good afternoon to you all and uh, welcome to the 65th annual metaphysical conference of indian orthopedic association now as you know we started indian arthroplasty association as a sub specialty section of indian orthopedic association way back in 1995 and we have completed 25 long years last year so we celebrated the silver jubilee year last year but unfortunately because of the pandemic that uh, we couldn't meet face to face but uh, we didn't uh, you know stop there but we kept the academics from indian arthroplasty association going in the form of webinars every month so we started in the may and now we have almost every month we are you know doing one webinar on behalf of indian arthroplasty association and you must be all attending this webinars now today is the iaa sub specialty section of uh, indian orthopedic association meeting in the 65th annual conference of this indian orthopedic association we are greatly thankful to professor rc meena the president of indian orthopedic association 2020 as well as you know professor b sibashankar who is the president of indian orthopedic association 2021 as well as the ioa kan 65th ioa kan program coordinator scientific committee coordinator dr arun sharma for giving us an opportunity to be here now for this session dr shamir agrawal our honorary secretary was supposed to be sharing with me but unfortunately he had some emergencies so hence i now request dr arun sharma associate professor in orthopedics at sms medical college jaipur and also the ioa kan uh, 2020 scientific program coordinator to co-chair with me dr arun you are there so yes sir i am uh, very much here and thank, thank you sir i am privileged and honored to share that uh, session uh, chair the session with you sir thank you thank you for being with us uh, just to let the delegates know that we have revamped our website and this is the new website www.indianarthroplastyassociation.com those you are not at members of this association please join you can do become a online member by paying your you know membership fees online and if you have any suggestions to offer you can write to indianarthroplasty@gmail.com this is the secretarial email id or in my personal email id dr ss mohanty hotmail.com i am dr mohanty i am the present president of this organization and without wasting any time let me stop sharing my screen let's Uh, start the session now and today we have you know beautiful lectures the first three lectures are dedicated to the common problems faced by indian arthroplasty of uh, surgeons like you know how to choose a bearing surface and next lecture will be on the thr infused hips now there are a lot of you know commotions about you know uh, the spino pelvic relationship in a fused hip how to put the cup and how to approach that we will discuss and followed by the commonest mistake what we do in the revision situation how to address the acetabular deficiencies that will be followed by a session a lecture on the periprostate joint infection by me from indian perspective because uh, you know infection is the commonest mode of uh, revision in our country and after that lecture we will have three more lectures which will address the recent advances in orthoplasty using technology and also how to manage the fixed flexion deformity which is again a very common condition in indian scenario and at last we have a invited lecture from none other than dr amar ranawat from hospital for special surgery who will focus on the uncemented tkr which is probably the future dear friends please don't leave your seat glue to your wherever you are to go through this wonderful session now may i request uh, dr arun sharma to invite the first speaker for this session over to dr arun please right sir now i would invite dr ashish sharma uh, former associate professor of orthopedics in sms medical college jaipur and trained orthoplasty surgeon has done thousands of orthoplasty a big name in orthoplasty knee and hip in northern india dr ashish sharma he will be talking about wearing surfaces in thr dr ashish sharma
thank you dr arun thank you dr mohanty and uh, thank you the organizers uh, uh, of icon mini icon so let's get going and uh, kick off this session with uh, looking at the bearing surfaces in total hip replacement so we have a plethora and a huge range and huge spectrum of options for uh, total hip replacements um, from the different designs from different bearing surfaces from different uh, materials uh, and uh, uh, we will be looking at the bearing surfaces and why bearing surfaces and choosing a, the correct bearing surface for the correct patient is so important so uh, as we can see uh, the focus is on the wear rate because wear rate uh, is so critical in uh, the longevity and performance of a hip replacement and the success of a joint replacement and traditionally historically we've uh, seen how successful the polyethylene and metal bearing surfaces have been but uh, there have been issues of uh, the wearing and the particle debris of uh, these bearing surfaces the metal on poly so the traditional poly has uh, uh, shown a higher higher wear rate of the uh, the bearing surface and that led to a lot of failure of joints so new and new bearing surfaces have uh, been uh, developed and they have started coming um, and this diagram actually shows how much uh, uh, each bearing surface uh, uh, releases the uh, the wear particles the debris so from from uh, cobalt chrome polyethylene the traditional poly to the newer generation poly to the metal on metal and the uh, ceramic on poly and the ceramic on ceramic so the ceramic on ceramic uh, releases the least amount of uh, particle debris so the decision making what are the factors which uh, help us decide and uh, which joint to choose for which patient so we have to know about the past and the current technology uh, the durability based on laboratory testing and clinical use and what are the drawbacks of each bearing surface so uh, we have to understand that the early revisions uh, are, dis are uh, uh, reflected by the type of bearing surface the age of the patient the sex of the patient the activity level the bone stock the geographic region that the patient comes from and the fiscal year of the financial the primary procedure and the comorbid conditions of the patient now this data is from the uh, australian joint registry uh, last year released in september last year and this shows the, that the main cause for uh, failure and the revisions uh, of a primary uh, joint replacement has been loosening so this is the the number one uh, factor which uh, we have to consider how to increase the life of a joint and we all uh, have uh, seen and understood that the cause of loosening of a hip replacement uh, the osteolysis is mainly because of macrophage induced inflammatory response and the steps that it happens is that the there is a prosthetic micromotion and that releases the particular debris uh, which actually activates the macrophages and that causes osteolysis and these are the cellular mechanisms how all this happens so this was the uh, australian joint registry in 2012 uh, but the new registry so that so the new registry let's look at the new registry released last year this gives us a follow up of 19 years which is long a uh, very strong data so the ceramic on ceramic the main joints the ceramic on highly crossing poly the metal on highly crossing poly and the ceramicized metal highly crossing poly which is the uh, oxinium so these have performed the best over the years in this registry and this is a very solid data so this helps us choose which joint for for different patients and which bearing surface we should prefer again uh, the primary conventional total hip replacement by bearing surface this line shows that the metal on metal large size 
heads have a high failure rate. So this has almost been withdrawn from everywhere. But other joint, other bearing surfaces are almost equal. The least wear rate and the longevity, uh, the maximum, the, the least revision rate has been of the uh, oxymium highly crosslinked poly from the Australian Joint Registry uh, released last year in September. Again, uh, the type of poly, the traditional poly and the crosslinked poly. So this has almost been banned in many countries, including US. Uh, now, this is the only poly available in, in many countries, but we still get this poly. So I think we should avoid this poly, the traditional poly. Again, by the, uh, as you can see, the uh, loosening is highest with the uh, traditional poly. The lysis is least with the uh, highly crosslinked poly. So this is how the data is showing. Um, uh, over the years. As for the head size, uh, it, the data says that we should use uh, 32 or less. 32 is now the standard, the gold standard. And this is coming all coming from, from the, the big registries. Uh, Australian Joint Registry is, is a very systematic and a very strong uh, data and uh, piece of evidence. And uh, again, by the head size, uh, the mixed ceramic or ceramic on ceramic. Again, if you have to use a larger head, prefer ceramic on ceramic. So 36 and 40 even are doing better as con compared to smaller ceramics. So if you have to use ceramic and if you, if you want to choose a bigger head size, maybe for more stability, maybe for younger patients. So choose larger size ceramic on ceramics. And again, uh, uh, the head surface and polyethylene, we've already seen this. But so all bearings have their problems. Poly has a uh, uh, problem of wear. Metal has a problem of uh, loosening, wear iron, uh, increased wear and iron release. And ceramics have their problems of uh, stripe wear, squeaking and fractures. So there has, in, has been extensive research for the ideal bearing surface. So these are the characteristics that it should have a superior wear characteristic, it should be durable, it should be bioinert, cost-effective, easy to implant, and even suitable for young uh, patients for increased longevity. So we have, they're, they're looking at, at, the, at changing in design, uh, changing in the, uh, the poly, this changing in surface modification of the metal, changes in improvement of the ceramic, and use of alternative materials. So larger femoral head is preferred because it gives more stability, uh, how can we uh, develop larger femoral heads with longer, uh, increased longevity? A monoblock metal shell with pre-assembled ceramic liner, dual mobility cups, and a combination of different bearing surfaces. Highly cross, high, high cross-linking of the poly, like X, X3, vitamin E reinforced poly, multi-walled carbon nanotube reinforced poly, and poly surface modification with a biomembrane. Again, the surface is being treated by titanium nitride, titanium niobium nitride, and fourth generation ceramics are already available now, uh, delta ceramics. Diamond, diamond coating on surfaces, carbon-based composite materials, oxidized zirconium coating on ceramics, silicon nitride coating and sapphire coatings. So let's look uh, at these uh, different options that we have now and which are on the horizon. The larger head ceramic on ceramic, 32 or more, they have increased range of motion and they reduce dislocation rate and they have good reasonable longevity. Monoblock metal shell with pre-assembled ceramic liner. They allow use of larger heads in smaller establum, permits increased range of motion and especially good for short Asian patients. Dislocation rate is extremely low and the establer component being a monoblock system has significant technical considerations. Dual mobility. So this uses both the principles of Charnley, like the smaller head, and also the principle of Mekifar for using larger head. So uh, best of both worlds. This, so this is an attractive option in challenging situations of unstable total hepatoplasties. Ceramic on metal, this is also on the horizon. Clinical trials are going on. And uh, there are expectations that soon this will be launched 
after US FDA clearance. Highly cross-linked poly, again, there are issues regarding uh, stabilization strategies. The antioxidant and anthocyanin is freely available in plants and this has been incorporated. This is said to be four times uh, more antioxidant properties than vitamin E. And this is again in the pipeline and a lot of clinical research is going on. Vitamin E stabilized poly, we've already started using this and it's uh, said to be, uh, we don't have uh, personal data, but the, the, uh, the registries show that they, they are performing well. Now, again, another surface which is on the horizon is multi-walled carbon nanotube reinforced polyethylene. So few animal studies have observed the adverse effect of uh, uh, this uh, liner, this bearing surface on the lung, liver and renal tissues. So it's still not clear, got clearance. Surface modification of polyethylene with uh, biomembrane mimicking polymers. Again, this is a very exciting thing. And uh, this is already being used uh, in other specialties for like uh, for intravascular stents, soft contact lenses, artificial lung and heart. Uh, and they've got already got US FDA clearance. So research is going on for developing this kind of uh, membrane for the uh, lining of the uh, joint surfaces. Surface modification of metal. This has already been launched here, titanium, niobium, nitride. And this is uh, four times, four to eight times uh, better wear properties than steel and poly. Zirconium, uh, further improvements in ceramics. We already have this now and further research is going on for developing uh, larger head ceramics. And uh, new alternative materials on the horizon are diamond-like carbon films, carbon-based composite materials, oxidized zirconium, silver nitride and sapphire. So a lot of new things are on the horizon and maybe next decade will, will uh, offer us a lot more options with uh, increased longevity and better performance of uh, total hip replacements. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Asis. Uh, Asis and me were together and trained by Professor Katie Dolakia that was uh, you know 25 years back in bombay hospital uh, i thank asis uh, to present this an excellent uh, you know exposition of uh, different kinds of bearing surfaces also he gave an idea about uh, what is going to be in future and that was a great uh, and uh, excellent uh, lecture by dr asis sharma asis uh, 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 may i have a question please yes i'll, I'll just um, can you tell uh, our uh, delegates that uh, at present in india okay we are considering all you know patients in indian situation at present usually you know our patients are uh, short statured ladies you know with a small acetabulum say 44 46 today morning i was operating a case who has got 44 size acetabulum and a young patient that was post tubercular hip and you know uh, 35 years old lady so what would be the best uh, bearing surface for a small acetabulum that you would recommend? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Mohanty. And uh, I still remember our days in uh, Bombay Hospital. We yeah. worked with Dr. Dolakia's Dolakia yeah. unit. We had such a nice time. So uh, regarding your question, um, I think uh, the best performing joints uh, are now uh, ceramic on poly, the uh, highly crossing poly. Uh, this should be preferred. But uh, for young ladies, uh, if uh, the, the size of the establum is an issue. I think choose uh, at least 32, uh, if not more. So 32, if you can choose uh, for the head size, uh, reasonable stability and reasonable longevity. Um, uh, depending on the cost, see, ceramics are a little costly. Uh, so if cost is an issue, in, uh, which is uh, sometimes an issue in Indian scenario. So I think uh, metal can be chosen uh, unless the patient is very young. Uh, if the patient is young, then yes, uh, ceramic on poly. Uh, highly crossing poly. Yeah. So that is the message that ceramic on polyethylene is uh, at present supposed to be the best bearing surface. Though ceramic ceramic has got some concerns and technically also to put a ceramic line and one has to be technically perfect to put the cup in proper position to avoid an impingement and to avoid an, uh, you know, 
ceramic fracture and uh, all other issues like you know the squeaking of the ceramics etc etc so for an average or a general orthopedic surgeon the ceramic and polyethylene now supposed to be the best bearing surface at least in our country because we have little cost issues so and for a short indian lady ceramic and polyethylene would give rise to a good you know long term outcome moreover the elevated you know liners are available in polyethylene only it is not possible in ceramics so in order to achieve a better stability and uh, to provide a good stable hip probably elevated liners can be used in the uh, case of polyethylene uh, dr arun is there any question from the you know audience uh -huh. sir right now it seems that talk was very crystal clear there is no question from the audience okay then we can invite uh, our next speaker thank you dr ashish may i request uh, dr arun to invite our next speaker please sir when the line up next we do got dr aditya agarwal grow our team his talk is ready he he was likely to join virtually but because of certain issues he has sent his live video which we going to play okay and thereafter we will face the questions okay dr aditya agrawal is a professor and mm -hmm. unit head in postgraduate institute of medical and research chandigarh and uh, he is an uh, you know experienced orthoplasty surgeon and uh, he is going to discuss about the you know the arthroplasty total hip arthroplasty in fused hips so fused hip means it could be ankylosing spondylitis it may be you know fibrous ankylosis or what not uh, let's see dr aditya's lecture please. such patients are usually young patients there is problem in function posture and distribution and bones are usually deformed and there is muscle atrophy in such patients there will be lot of soft tissue contracture the types of injuries surgery are there alteration of normal energy and additional difficulty proper positioning of the patient is uh, difficult and the implant mal positioning is very difficult especially at the top and the uses of the contralateral hip is is a problem the contralateral limb is still not there that is the thing of words the contralateral limb is still not there it will be Affection of the contralateral hip. This is affection of affection and contralateral hip. This is very excellent. So it is fixed in the affection is it affecting? It is a kind of affection or just leading to less activity. If it is fixed in affection with affection. Cup will be filled with a more infection. Even in uterus, very likely in uterus, infection of uterus. And if the bone is due to another uterus, the pelvic tissue is infected in there, and the pelvic landmarks are not there, and more pollution of the pelvic may lead to increased pressure. We also have not been identified by temperature not attributed to them. That is not an immediate immediate reaction. Many of not reaction is identified by including the anterior reaction. We go primary arch in the lateral. 
Let the sections of Mongol Jewish tribes in Sikkim was talking of the country of the struggle. We can really part of the matter. Or should we seek to avoid the three to three to present or dividing the two to the government all the time? The important ones are to fight for the whole of the real life of the government. The main part of the whole is to do this thing. And then the beginning of the establishment of this program by spatial in the art of the most, the majority of the cases, total official is in the country, indicating the location of the original people. The bones are often hospitable and keep the slaves, but for the moment in the game, when the country is in the region of the hall, the bones are overwhelming the section of the bones are going to be used in the game. We should avoid to do those while the person is getting the book or reducing or reducing the books. Therefore, we get the meaning of the negotiation to be done. In severe attacking, severe attacking, official release can be performed. Choice of time plan. We can use the blood in our bodies after all because of dynamic activity. Simply put, it stands to discuss the questions that are the question, which are important for the durability of the complications. High rates of the topic of the topic are seen in the language to the extent of the full scientific stress. And we are the ages, they set the meeting of the time they can get to the understanding which was my position of the time. I present some of the cases, and first cases, the meeting was very clear to the meeting of the time. It was made earlier for the first half of the meeting. With a similar statement. After a follow-up of four and a half years, it was an excellent result. It was a patient of two without any limb. It was a limb. And we can swap also. Another patient of 29 years old, we have got intuition is one of the ways. So, semantic books are not the opposite of semantic books, but the follow-up of the book. This is the video of the patient walking on the road. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Aditya, for uh, presenting an excellent series of uh, total hip replacement uh, in uh, fused hips. Uh, is there any questions from the audience? Or, or is Dr. Aditya available for taking some questions? Sir, uh, Dr. Aditya is actually not uh, able to join live. So, but any questions we can uh, take up, uh, no problem. Yeah. Any question from the audience? I request those uh, delegates who are you know joining on the web platform, they can type their questions on the chat box. So we'll try to answer them. This is an excellent lecture on the you know totally placement fused dips, especially the placement of the cup is extremely important. That uh, you know when the spine is uh, you know stiff and uh, there is obliteration of the lumbar lordosis because in ankylosing spondylitis cases, you have to, you know, put the cup in proper position in order to avoid a dislocation. And uh, if you do a proper job, then uh, probably it will avoid a dislocation and it will avoid a further complications that patient get improved range of movement. So they are, they, these are the patients who are the most satisfied patients. So you can go ahead with the, you know, doing total hip replacements in the ankylosed hips. Yes, uh, Dr. Arun, uh, let us uh, invite the uh, next speaker then. AV team, Dr. C.P. Paul, presentation. Can we play? Okay. So the next speaker is Dr. C.P. Paul. He's professor and head in SN Medical College, Agra. Profuse, uh, prolific orthoplasty surgeon. He has sent his live talk. I guess our Karam, audio Karam. visual team shall be able to play it. Yes. Team Grover? Dr. Paul, can you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh? Your, your kids yes. might wait. Yes, uh, I'm. I'm Jam. Okay. I'm on the way. Hey. Can you join us, sir? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just. Are, are you able to hear yeah. me, sir? Dr. Paul? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Good, good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Welcome, Hello. welcome, Hello. Dr. Paul. Before okay. you yeah, yeah, yeah. before you start, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, let, before you start, let me welcome Dr. Yeah. Uh, Amar Ranavat. He is there already on the chat, and he had given his comments yeah. that most fused hips converted to totally present will not dislocate due to persistent stiffness. Thank you, thank you, Amar, for those comments, and uh, let's move right with Dr. Paul's lecture. Yes, Dr. Paul, yeah. I have my slides over there, please. Uh, still, yeah. we are not able to see. Uh, slides, slides. Okay. Uh, slides. Double line the bone. Huh? I did triple line the bone. Okay. Line the okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. My slides over there. Yeah, we are just trying to play Hello. slides. Uh, Dr. Paul, we are trying to yeah. bring up your presentation. In the meantime, you can settle in your vehicle so that a lot many noises coming from all the side. You can cut them through. I'm just okay, trying okay. to Okay, okay. Okay. It's nice, nice. Mm. So in the meantime, uh, Dr. Paul, till your presentation comes to us and we play it, I would have to request Dr. S.S. Mohanty to deliver his talk on prostate joint infection, Indian perspective, because both are our um, Dr. Rajiv Thakral and Dr. C.P. Paul are finding it difficult to join. No problem. I can go uh, ahead. So uh, one more thing, uh, uh, I must uh, share that Rajiv, Dr. Rajiv Thakral has just arrived. Okay. And... Dr. Rajiv, are you ready with your talk? It is loaded or you just came? So Dr. Mohanty will take his talk and thereafter you will join us, sir. So Dr. Mohanty, sir, you will deliver your talk and thereafter Dr. Rajiv Thakral will speak, sir. Sure. I'll right, share sir. my screen then. Are you able to see my screen? Sir, we are not able to see your screen, sir. We are able to see you, but your screen is not yet shared. I don't know. It was not possible right now. Okay. Is it visible? Not yet, sir. Oh. Grover team, can we solve some? No. Yeah. Is it okay? Yes, sir. Okay. So, good afternoon, dear friends. Uh, uh, I thank uh, Dr. Arun Sharma, our uh, scientific committee coordinator of IOCAN, you know, 2020 and uh, Professor R.C. Sharma, President of Indian Orthopedic Association 2020 to, for, uh, you know, giving me an opportunity to say my thoughts on the chronic uh, periprosthetic joint infection and uh, from an Indian perspective. Dear friends, it is a teamwork. It involves other than the orthoplasty surgeon, you must have a good microbiologist along with you, an infectious disease specialist, and of course, a good laboratory backup to give you a proper culture and sensitivity as well as a histopathology report. So hence, all together, they form a team to handle the infected total joint replacements. Now, this is the 2011 AOS guidelines, which still most of us we follow in India to diagnose a periprosthetic joint infection. And as you know, the two major important points are sinus tract communicating the prosthesis and the second one is when you isolate a pathogen by culture in more than or equal to two tissue or fluid samples when you aspirate the joint. So these are two most important points. But the confusion lies when both these things are not there, then how to diagnose a case of periprosthetic joint infection. I'll give you an algorithm. They have given this four out of six criteria, but how to approach a joint periprosthetic joint infection. So first thing, when you get a patient and you are suspecting infection, in India, we do ESR and CRP. These are the two most important investigations to be done first. If both are positive or both are high, the infection is likely. But if either of them are positive, then you proceed to aspiration of the joint. And knee joint aspiration has got a higher you know, positivity rate compared to the hip joint aspiration. Now, when you do aspiration, please send the samples 
both for total count and differential count as well as culture sensitivity when you see the counts are high and culture sensitivity is positive that means both are positive then again infection is likely but if either of them are positive then please repeat the knee aspiration after 2 weeks and send again the samples for total count and culture and please remember within these 2 weeks do not put these patients on any kind of antibiotics because that will again alter your results just treat this patient symptomatically with some kind of you know nsaids now after a knee repeat knee aspiration if either of them are positive then again infection is likely but if both of them are negative and if you have planned for surgery that means suppose in the x ray you see radiolucent lines or there is osteolysis then intra operative frozen section will be helpful and you send it to experienced pathologist and the sample should be sent from a most inflamed site inside the joint if there are more than 10 neutrophils for hyperfilled then probably infection is likely and you have to treat the joint as infected but if you have not planned the surgery that means if the prosthesis is well fixed and functioning well then keep these patients under observation for 3 months and again repeat the whole algorithm what i told you but remember again within this 3 months please do not put these patients on any kind of antibiotics because again it will alter your diagnostic you know criteria so this patient has to be treated only symptomatically because if it is infection it is going to get infected and you have to treat infection and if it is not infection you, you, by giving antibiotics it is anyway it's not going to help you so please remember do not just arbitrarily put a higher antibiotic in this kind of patient probably the nuclear imaging has got some role but uh, practically speaking all the nuclear imaging imaging like technetium scan gallium scan or indium scan all these are pet scan they do not have any role in the diagnosis of infection now this is the most recent 2018 criteria for pgi diagnosis according to aos but please remember this criteria depends mostly on the laboratory investigations like d dimer level leukocyte esterase alpha dipensin which is not available to most of our indian orthopedic associations in any of these you know uh, many places mostly you know in the cities also it is not available so we do not follow this criteria at present but if it is available then you can follow this criteria but please remember the two major criteria remain same according to 2011 or 2018 criteria that is positive cultures and sinus tract communicating the prosthesis now there is a modified classification from 2003 onwards where we have added the type 1 that is positive intraoperative cultures supposedly for a aseptic revision or supposedly for a primary joint which you have not thought of infected but other types like type 2 and type 3 this is early post operative infection and it is you know type 3 and type 4 are more than one month after the surgery and type 2 is basically a, you know superficial to the joint or deeper to the joint type 2a and type 2b for a type 3 is more than one month acute onset this is type 4 late chronic infection more than one month of insidious onset now basically the treatment remains on all these things either you give antibiotic therapy or take the patient for a debridement and irrigation of the knee or the hip and while you're doing debridement and irrigation you decide to retain the components or remove the components and if you are removing the components then you decide whether you are going to do a one stage reimplantation or a two stage reimplantation that means in the first stage you do a debridement put a cement spacer and then treat these patients with antibiotic then maybe beyond 6 weeks to 3 months or so then you put the reimplantation at the second stage the last option remains when the even two stage reimplantation fails then you go for a usually arthrodesis of the knee or do a resection arthroplasty in the hip joint but please remember most of the surgeons in our country we followed a two stage reimplantation which remains the gold standard now let's come to type 1 which is positive intraoperative culture, culture supposedly for aseptic revision or supposedly you know you are doing a joint for asepsis aseptic joint so what happens you diagnose this after the surgery that means when you get the culture report there you put these patients on post operative antibiotic for about 6 weeks as per the culture sensitivity report and assess the esr crp as a prognostic marker every weekly but please remember 
always whenever you collect the samples to send it for culture send a sample for histopathological examination because tuberculosis is very common in our country and hence you one must look for the cox and if it is diagnosed anti you know tuberculosis then you can put these patients on the anti tubercular treatment now this is a 38 years old male multiple surgeries you know polytrauma patient got infected and uh, subsequently was put on a joint but subsequently got infected there are multiple scar tissue we did a two stage reconstruction we put the cement spacer but uh, while doing the second stage we had sent the samples for culture and from the tibia the sample showed a growth of methicillin sensitive staph aureus this was treated with six weeks of antibiotic and this is the three and a half years follow up of this patient without any recurrence of infection a type 1 infection now type 2 basically it varies from superficial cellulitis to deep infection you can treat these patients with antibiotic alone or do a debridement wound dehiscence necrosis infected hematoma all these fall into type 2 but remember if you are doing antibiotic giving only antibiotic that may control the symptoms delay another operation but not strictly curative but however if you give inadvertently high dose of antibiotic that may lead to resistance we saw it in 1950s penicillin resistance in 1970s methicillin resistance 90s we saw vancomycin intermediate resistance and in 2002 onwards we are seeing also vancomycin resistant staph aureus and we studied this and published in the jbjs the british volume in 2003 that uh, though you can control the mrsa by doing a mrsa screening but it was found that more than 55% of patient were methicillin resistant coagulase negative staphylococcus so this is the emerging problem in our country as well and all over the world remember higher the antibiotic chosen by the surgeon for prophylaxis the lower the confidence in his setup so the higher the antibiotic you choose to treat the patient then you are improving the or encouraging the antibiotic resistance probably you don't have a confidence in your setup or operating room now one word about debridement antibiotic and implant retention it should be done in the early post operative period when the joint is less than 3 months or late hematogenous infection with less than 3 weeks in the onset of the symptoms the best results are obtained when there is a short duration of symptoms and there is a stable implant inside and there is a healthy surrounding soft tissues and a patient or the host itself is very immunocompetent but it should not be done on an emergency procedure one should remember to do it it in the earliest available routine theater but one should not try this dire procedure in case of chronic infection when there is a presence of a sinus tract like this or if there are loose implants which are there inside and avoid in case of rheumatoids when there is a high esr and when there are resistant organisms like mrsa or gram negative bacteria because the results are poor in these cases basically you do a thorough synovectomy by excising all the synovium in the suprapatellar pouch parapatellar gutters take out the polyethylene so that you can approach the posterior aspect of the joint and do a thorough debridement of the posterior aspect of the joint and especially one need to curate the prosthesis you know cement or cement bone interface because there the granulation tissue remains and that causes osteolysis so curate it thoroughly meticulously around this site then take the samples from different sites five to six samples then do a thorough lavas usually i do with hydrogen peroxide vitrated in lavas and use a pulsatile lavas in order to achieve a you know good debridement there and close this skin with a monofilament nylon suture and remember five to six tissue samples should be taken from the most inflamed site and to reach the laboratory as soon as possible we cannot send it later keeping it in the refrigerator and tell your microbiologist to you know culture it in enriched medium for about 14 days and always as i told you earlier send a tissue for a histopathological examination to rule out cox or sometimes you may see fungal hyphae there in the histopathological examination so this is a 46 year old female bilateral sequential tear left knee got infected we did a debridement we exchanged the polyethylene and put the calcium sulfate cement pellets uh, impregnated with antibiotic which subsequently gets observed and that is four and a half years infection free patient this is our outcome studies compared to contemporary literature it is about more than 76% success rate and mostly we found coagulase negative staphylococcus the organism and the predictors of poor outcome is a knee joint or a high asa grade patients 
Now, type three is a basically acute hematogenous infection where the patient was all right and there was an interval period of well-being, but subsequently develop pain and restriction of the movements and patient may become febrile. So you can do a debridement with component retention or removal. Type four is the late chronic infection where you do a one or two stage exchange. Remember, though the one stage exchange has got a superior functional outcome, but if you see the that one stage revision has got 34% almost greater adjusted risk for reinfection than two stage reimplantation. Hence, two stage exchange remains the gold standard, where in the first stage you take out all the hard rewire materials, everything, metals, and all the cement and put an antibiotic stable cement spacer. And during the interval, you treat the infecting organism according to culture sensitivity for six weeks. Yes, RCRP used as a prognostic marker and patient is mobilized with some kind of support. And after six weeks, you give some time or give antibiotic holiday and see if there is any recurrence of infection and then go ahead with the second stage whenever yes, RCRP is coming down or a downward trend take cultures from multiple sites, send specimen for histopathology. If in doubt, do a again frozen section there on the table. There are different prefabricated spacers are available in the market. They are very expensive with limited sizes and availability is a problem. And we have our own you know, spacer for the heap. This is a, this is a presented in the 2015 Jaipur annual IOCON as a Silver Jubilee lecture. This is soft, malleable, adjust, you can adjust the offset, adjust length, adjust diameter, adjust version, as well as provide rotational stability, and you can easily remove during second stage, hence it offers the complete modularity. Best for thing is that you can autoclave it and reuse it almost 100 times. And these are the implants which you can use inside either a K-nail or a leisure of rod or a you know, rust nail, whatever, depending upon the canal diameter. And this is after putting the spacer, patient can be mobilized right from the next day with uh, immediately with uh, some kind of uh, you know support like a walker or a stick. And uh, we have published our series in the Indian Journal of Orthopedics in 2013 in about 24 patients at a time. This is a patient, as you can see here, 53 years old male infected bipolar ME arthroplasty. First spacer was put, still there are cement inside. The infection then can get control. Second spacer was put, but it was unstable. The infection didn't get control. So we put a third spacer along with our, you know, templates. And that is the, uh, you know, post-operative X-ray after the second stage surgery. And that is the follow-up of this patient, almost seven years follow-up of this patient after this chronically infected patient, the hip biomechanics were restored. Remember to remove all the foreign bodies, including cement. Infection doesn't get control in presence of instability and biology takes over when infection gets controlled. Now, two contoured spacer you can use in the knee like this. As you can see here, it is available in the market or else you can do like this that, uh, you know, you can put the cement on the femur and mold it with the polyethylene and you can put some cement on the tibia and mold with the femoral component, extracted femoral component and then extend the knee and just achieve stability. That is the way you can put the cement spacers in your knee that you can, you know, do a, this is a known as a mobile spacers, you know, you are making it on the table and mold it with the respective components in order to give a mold. This is a patient, you can put a monoblock spacer when the knee is unstable. And this is a rheumatoid lady, you know, 15 years old infection, where you have to take out this implants and then put, prepare the cement cigars like this using the, you know, syringes, 5 cc, 2 cc syringes like that. And these cigars along with the cavers are put inside the respective medullary canals and then pack with the cement. That is a monoblock spacer there to provide the knee stability. That is the post-operative X-ray. And that is the patient can be mobilized, patient is a polyarticular rheumatoid on a rollator there. And, and this is a stable spacer where the patient can walk along with this rollator. This is another patient, ankylosing spondylitis, and uh, we have our polyethylene templates. Which is right, this is right now, it is an experimental stage. We prepare a spacer like this along with the templates, and we put it inside like this, and this is the X-ray, how does it look like, and subsequently converted to a two-stage reconstruction, and that is the latest follow-up of four and a half years of the patient, and that is the function of this patient. <coughs> so take-home message. Yes, sir, CRP aspiration is the hallmark of diagnosis. Have a high index of suspicion for tuberculosis and fungus. 
especially in immunosuppression patients or diabetic patients antibiotic resistance is a concern one should avoid using high you know uh, higher antibiotics in order to avoid a resistance one must use a judicious decision for debridement antibiotic uh, you know um, uh, implant retention and antibiotics and uh, uh, you know debridement two stage revision remains the gold standard one must learn the techniques of putting a stable special preparation on the table and the techniques of orthodesis and excision orthoplexy remains the last option i thank you for a patient hearing if there is any question then i can take it right now we welcome uh, uh, our president of indian orthopedic association professor rc mina who is there right now on the dais thank you sir for uh, giving us an opportunity you have to unmute sir please unmute sir can i speak yeah yeah yes yeah. yeah yeah now you are audible monty sir are you hearing me yeah yeah sure yes sir, sir monty sir thank you very much to you not to me that you have given a wonderful session in the mini iocon do it known as uh, called the mini icon but it has been proved that it is a full icon all orations <laughs> the plenary sessions and the legend of orthopedic dr uh, sm tuli dr ss yadav dr pravin kanava dr sudhir kapoor dr sip shankar dr parag bhushan dr ashish and dr mohanty himself is it then <laughs> attached with this conference nobody can say that this can be the mini this has been more than many or general conference sir so nice of you you have given so wonderful sir, knowledge to our sir, sir we welcome dr amar ranawat who is there from us he has already joined in spite of its early morning that is great there. that is yeah. a another another feather in our being and cap thank you Definitely. amar can you, can you see your video amar sir 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 thank you very much sir thank you sir subhran sir, yes, sir. Ah, next Question, sir. So, yes, sir. Question, please. Sir, what is your antibiotic recommendation for your primary, and what is your antibiotic recommendation, including the duration for infective revisions? Thank you, sir, for the question. You know, usually in the United States, they follow. a first generation cephalosporin as prophylactic antibiotic for a primary joint and they gave it only three doses in united kingdom similarly they select you know second generation cephalosporin as skefuroxime 1.5 g before surgery then you know 750 mg after 8 hours and 16 hours that is their antibody prophylaxis protocol for the primary joint in united states and united kingdom in our country we do not have a fixed protocol for a prophylaxis for a primary joint so it better that if you have your own setup then you do cultures take culture samples from your theater complexes from the operating table from anesthesia trolley from the air you know from different you know places and see that which organism is a normal commensal to your setup and see that what antibiotic is sensitive to for example in our institute we have 13 theater complexes and the samples are taken by hospital infection committee every 6 months and they recommend us antibiotics and at present our recommendation is that we for give a second generation cephalosporin plus an aminoglycoside as a prophylactic antibiotic so this is so you have to select your own antibiotic prophylaxis depending upon what is the normal commensal second question is that you know how long to give antibiotics in a infected joint you know there is no fixed you know recommendation in the literature but it's a generally what we follow that we give our almost about 6 weeks of antibiotics in bone and joint infections you know depending upon the culture sensitivity report and following the 6 weeks then before doing the second stage we leave the patient without antibiotics for about a couple of weeks it some surgeons do 2 weeks some people 4 weeks and uh, normally i leave them for 6 weeks within this time see if there is any recurrence of infection if the patient is immunocompromised then there will be recurrence of infection so if you are putting a new joint again that will get infected so better to see that if there is no recurrence your esrcrp is coming down to normal 
then go ahead safely with a second stage you know uh, joint replacement and while doing a second stage please, please again give antibiotics depending upon your culture sensitivity and it should be given for about you know 24 to 48 hours whatever is your primary uh, replacement protocol thank you very much thank you dr amar ranawat has put on the you know uh, chat box that discuss one versus two stage that uh, you know what are the advantage disadvantages now remember that uh, one stage uh, reconstruction in an infected hip is usually you know uh, it is cost effective patient loses you know patient uh, remains away from his work for a lesser time and it is cost effective in a immuno competent host and patient has, has got an early functional recovery that patient was having pain or you know there are some uh, uh, disability patient earlier recovers from pain pain but the disadvantage is that there are chances of recurrence though you know world's best centers have shown about 84 to 85 percent you know outcome in case of hips and knees also they are showing better outcome but uh, two stage reconstruction remains the gold standard because you are more you know <laughs> amenable to control the infection by giving antibiotics and you are sure that there is no infection inside then only you go ahead with the second stage but it is expensive the patient has to be admitted twice to the hospital two surgeries and uh, so those are the disadvantages involved so the chances of reinfection is less in two stage reconstruction compared to one stage thank you thank you amar for creating you know this uh, you know two stage reconstruction is the gold standard because you are more you know uh, amenable to control the infection by giving antibiotics and you are sure that there is no infection inside then only you go ahead with the second stage but yeah. it is expensive the patient has to be admitted twice to the hospital two surgeries and uh, so those are the disadvantages involved so the chances of reinfection is less in two stage reconstruction yeah, compared to one stage to we'll resume in a minute i guess thank you thank you thank you, thank you smarajit for those uh, comments uh, Sir, so, Mohanty, you are not. We are not able to hear, hear you. Hello. Yeah. Yes, sir. You are able to hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. If there are no other questions, then we can move ahead with the next speaker sir, because we are lagging Dr. behind. Dr. Rajiv Thakural has got a question for you, sir. Yeah, yeah. Please, Rajiv Thakural. Hi, Dr. Mohanty. Hi. How are you? <laughs> I am good. Nice meeting you. And nice to see you online like this. But anyway, the question is more of a technical question, really. It's you've shown pretty good uh, examples of your templates that you've made for both the hip and the knee for revision. So my question really is, how do you fix these? Do you use a separate batch of cement to fix the the knee, for example, that you've made the the template that you've made? You use a separate batch of cement to fix it to the bone, or what do you do? Yeah, good question. That uh, you know almost. Three to four packets of cement, I keep it ready. And usually, I use a palaka cement because there is a higher concentration of concentration of antibiotic elution from palaka cement compared to other cements. So I use a palaka uh, with gentamicin impregnated palaka, and I add additional antibiotics depending upon the culture. You now, most of the time, I add vancomycin or you know uh, sometimes cephalosporins also I add. Now, with one packet, I prepare the femoral you know mold. as well as the you know the uh, as i showed you the cement cigars i prepare uh, using the uh, syringes either 2 cc or 5 cc syringe depending upon the canal diameter another packet i prepare the tbl part and i also build up the tbl along with that packet of cement if it is you know if there is instability and next if it still there is a huge gap then again i can mix another packet of cement and then try to fix it this components and i usually do it at a later part of the cement setting because i don't want a good micro interlock here because we have to anyway take it out later on that will lead to more bone loss while taking out so i put a later part when the cement is almost setting that time i put it and then achieve the stability in case of hips i prepare with my own templates and if there is a narrow canal usually that uh, you know fits snugly i don't require any more mixes of cement but if it doesn't fit snugly then i usually i take a 20 gram packet of cement and then you know fix it just proximally near the calcar region loosely the problem is really getting the version right especially in the hip because you say you have to get the version right how do you yeah. control the version technic i mean technically how do you control that version if you have say a loose packet of cement which is not really holding it it's sort of going to rotate inside 
yeah if it it is snugly fitting then then you know that is the that is the thing if if i get the version right and if it tightly snugly fitting then i don't have to sometimes you know i have to really hammer it if the narrow canal then i have to hammer with the impactor and uh, that uh, that gets fixed in the version but otherwise you can always mix a packet of cement and give the version put it in desired degree of version thank you thank you so your talk uh would wake up everybody in the hall there were questions now i would request dr rajiv thokral he has come all the way from delhi is in all the way from delhi it's only from delhi i see he said but in a prolific arthroplasty surgeon working in the asian hospital gurgaon besides that he is an orthopedic researcher which sometimes considered as oxymoron but it is something which has become in the uh, become a, a normal uh, phenomenon and people are in, in getting interested in more and more research he has done a lot of research courses as well as all over india so i would invite dr thokral thank you for that introduction but i don't really think i am deserving all of that after dr mohanty's uh, actually extensive talk on peri uh, prosthetic joint infection my talk is actually quite a simple one and i hope to make it something that all of us can learn something from rather than uh, you know something about how many cases i did or how many cases x y did it's more like a teaching lecture this one so bear with me uh, we know that on the acetabular side there is a problem and you do a total hip you get away with a femur which is slightly loose you can manage but if you have a problem on the acetabular side basically you're looking at failure happening early whether it's a cemented cup or it's an uncemented cup over time you are going to find that this is going to slowly slowly wear out and it's going to go into uh, osteolysis behind the cup so if you have on the cemented side you really have more of loosening which occurs within the 10 15 year uh, period radiological loosening you will see much more actually but the loosening happens and the patient has problems where because it's a pure poly cup usually is better but the problem is loosening so we have to take care of the loosening so therefore in younger patients you're looking at and i'm sure a lot of people will sort of argue with me about this but uh, you're looking at some form of hybrid fixation usually for a primary total hip whereas the uncemented cups have a different mode of failure they have more of osteolysis which may be even normally there and there may be a good nice stable fix in spite of that there will be some amount of loosening over time or it can happen immediately if you haven't got primary good fix in either case you will end up with a defect and my talk is really about how to deal with these defects while you're doing a revision there are two uh, one x-ray and one image of a really old uh, implant that was used not used anymore but is one of the oldest implants used for revision for uh, cup cage construct so i'm going to talk about how one defines this defect that ha happens in the acetabulum post uh, either a cemented or an uncemented failure the classification of these defects we most of us already know the paproxy classification it still holds good to the today if i can i'll show a small video about an explant but i'm sure again some of you have already seen it so an explant technique to remove implants without causing too much of bone damage and how does one really reconstruct these defects because that is really the key to this uh, lecture what are the implant options available the key being bone stock restoration because god forbid if the patient requires a re-revision you need to have bone stock and if i have time then i'll talk about some cases and i'll of course end it with some take home message so to define the defect radiology is usually not enough you do x-rays but x-rays can miss or under um, show the amount of actual defect occurring inside the acetabulum so you need to do ct scans or on mars mri and of course there's nothing better than intraoperative assessment because you need to know these lines on x ray you need to know uh, how high the uh, cup has migrated over time the amount of ischialysis and this sometimes you may not be able to see very well on an x ray you look at this x ray for example and you will say okay there's some amount of ischialysis but if you actually do surgery and you look at it intraop you'll say oh i didn't anticipate to so do ct scans in the past we would do um jude views as well but do ct scans because ct scans will actually show you the amount of osteolysis and the amount of bone or the amount of substitute you require to fill this defect and also it will show you what to prepare for what all keep uh, what all amount of you got to keep in your ot and sometimes you need to do mri to look at soft tissue reaction as well but the best way to identify is of course intraop once you've removed the cup once you've removed the 
astabular uh, component, only then can you truly get an idea of where the defect is and what all walls are intact, what columns are intact. So be prepared, but don't be super shocked when you actually do surgery, because that's when you have the real assessment. How does one classify them? Really, the whole purpose of classification is because the new cup that you're going to put in, the new astabular component that you're going to put in, is actually only going to fit in and going to be stable if you have good quality bone, if you have continuous bone, and there is no in in uh, sort of uh, discontinuity between the ileum and the ischium, which you can see in some cases. So you need some residual host bone because everything is going to fix on that. And you also need to have enough capacity for bone in growth onto whatever implant you put, uh, mostly an uncemented implant that you will put. So we know this classification. I'm going to run quickly through it. The Paproski one is when you have intact walls and it's a contained defect, a supportive defect. The rim is more or less intact. The columns are intact. You also have a two a Paproski two class uh, defect, which is either a superior medial migration or superior lateral migration or an isolated medial migration. But in all, the rim seems to be intact, more or less, and there's good amount of host bone, about 50% host bone contact, which is required for the subsequent cup placement. Then you have Paproski 3A, where you have cavitatory defects, where you have super superior lateral migration, which is more than three centimeters, and that may be having some amount of stability, but the defect is somewhere near half of the circumference, or you may have a segmental defect. So there's a defect of not only the wall, but also some part of the column, or you may have an extensive segmental defect where the entire column is lost and you have severe superlateral migration with less than 40% of post bone contact. And 3B is when you have a predominantly medial defect. Now, the purpose of all these uh, different classification is basically to get an idea of where you need to have fixation and where you need to put in your bone or your augment or your uh, filler so that you can get the cup down back to its original place where you want to place it, the correct center of rotation, the correct offset, the correct length of the limb. All that will only be possible if you have an idea of where the defect is and what to fill up. And of course, there's something called pelvic discontinuity when there's no contact between the uh, ileum and the ischium, whether it's a partial or complete fracture. And this can happen even during primary surgery. So you have to be prepared for that. I had a case where I had to actually switch from a primary implant to a revision implant intraoperatively because of a fracture that I caused during surgery. Right. So the purpose of classification, sh it should be simplified. It should be simple. So I use this. I say, is there support for the cup? Is the new cup that I'm going to put, is it like want to be supported by the bone? Is it partially supported by the bone or is it not supported at all? And also I will look at the bone quality to determine whether there's enough bone in growth capacity or there is no in growth capacity. And then I take my decision on to what revision implant to use and what approach to use. So implant extraction is also a key. I'm not going to talk too much about it because that's a lecture by itself, but implant extraction has to follow the principles of minimum bony and soft tissue damage. And that I think is the key for any surgery. And I firmly believe that if one thing has to go down to the younger audience, it should be that preserve the biology, try to preserve whatever host bone is there, try to preserve as much of soft tissue connections are there to the bone as much as possible, of course. So gently tap out your femur if you can, if it's a cemented stem, um, remove the um, um, cement mantle through using an extended trochanteric osteotomy if you can or through a, a ultrasonic burr if you have and remove the cup gently if you can, because you don't want to damage bone and create bigger defects. This is a small video. I think you've seen it probably. This is a video of how a well-fixed cemented, uh, sorry, an uncemented cup can be removed using the explant device. Uh, the explant device is really uh, something which fits into the cup. It's a little longish video and I can't unfortunately control it, but I'm sure you'll see this online if you went and you uh, looked for what is called the explant device, where you want to remove a well-fixed cup, and but you don't want to cause damage to the bone. So you have these nice um, jigs that fit into the into the cup, and you can then just cut out the bone from the margins margins of the astabular cup without removing extra bone. So it's going to take some time. So I think I'll just move ahead because I don't want to be the one who's uh, delaying the conference. Right? Uh, those who want to see it can take it online or take it from me. So the next step after you've taken it out is actually to assess the defect, and now. If you haven't prepared beforehand, you are going to be screwed. So please prepare beforehand. 
have an idea, have a good estimation of what you might need. In fact, over prepare, keep yourself ready with extra implants. You should have a surgical plan, plan A, plan B, plan C. The idea is of course, to use a cementless cup. Most of the times, if you can get some amount of hose bone to sort of take into and grow into this implant. But if you have say a smaller defect, you can use a cementless, uh, sorry, a cemented cup. You can use impaction bone drafting. You can use a mesh, which is a pretty good uh, uh, concept, which I recently learned. Or you can use large uh, uh, sort of uh, allograft for large defects. And then the question of whether you want to use a cage along with the cup, because if you're going to use a cage, you want to use a cemented cup is always dependent upon whether you have enough host bone there. So use whatever resources you have, make an identity. I'm going to show you how. And of course, there's a role of cement in cement revision. Uh, and I, I don't do that. So I won't talk much about that. So if you have a supportive bed, that the bed allows some amount of bone, you can actually create a hemisphere and you can do that without compromising the astral rim. You will get secure fixation with your primary or a large size jumbo sized cementless cup. So you get a more than 50 to 60% hose bone contact, good dome support, rim fit is good. You can go ahead with the primary implant. But if you have a non-supportive bed, you must be able to identify whether the non-supportive bed is because of a deficient wall or a deficient column or both. Because if you have a deficient wall, you can still manage because you just need about 50% of the hose bone contact. So you can manage to put in the cup in the right position through a multi-hole cup and you can put screws in the other places where bone is available and give some form of primary fixation. But if you don't have a good column, especially if you don't have the posture column, then you're in a big trouble. Then you have to first fix the posture column, uh, recreate the posture column or bypass that uh, part by fixing above and below with some kind of a cage to hold that cup and then place in the cup. So the idea is to have either a, a check on whether you have a wall or a column, and if you have both, and then you can use any device of these. You can use reinforcement rings. You can use a cup cage construct, which is um, from the first cup that I showed you in the title slide to the newer cups that are available, or you can use customized 3D printed cups with, with flanges, which have got screws in different position to hold on to whatever defect you have. So all these options are available today of course, you have to prepare them. So the implant options for cemented cups, usually you want to use some form of impaction grafting. So you have some form of hold into the host bone with the cement. Uh, for uncemented cups, you can use a larger size of what you call the jumbo cups, or you can use the oblong cups or the augmented cups. You can use either bone graft structural or tantalum augments to fill in sectoral defects or defects where you can actually define and uh, sort of uh, converted from a totally uncontained to a contained defect. And you can also use mesh with bone drafting. I think I'm running out of time. It's okay. All right. So I'll try to wrap it up fast. I don't like uh, delaying everybody else. So for cemented cups, the results are universally poor, unfortunately, but I told you this is a technique that I've seen where you can put in a mesh and you can pack in imp impaction bone drafting and you can use either a cemented or uncemented cup. And this works pretty well if you have a good technique you really use impaction bone drafting the right way. But most of the times you need to use either a large size cup and sometimes you can make mistakes on this cup because you may not get fixation in the place you want it. So you may end up with a slightly more vertical looking cup. Uh, if you're trying to manage with a single uh, primary uncemented jumbo cup and uh, sometimes, or this is more used in the past, not used so much more because of the augments available now, but you can use an oblong cup like this. And of course, there's trabecular metal and all those augments which are in different shapes and sizes, which actually fit into the defects and they sort of create new bone for you. And they also create a tissue reaction which stimulates bone. So you can use these augments. And there are many studies to show that you can use them and they're doing pretty well. And you can also use the rings where you find there's some form of in, in uh, uh, continuity between the proximal and the distal part of the astablum. That means the ileum and the ischium. So you can use any form of sort of uh, reconstruction ring or um, uh, um, uh, bypassing um, cage, and then you can uh, put in a cup into that cage. So some cases out here, just to show you, this is an example where the cup came out very easily. So this cup, of course, does not has not caused much damage to the bone. The rim was intact, so we managed with a large size cup, a jumbo uncemented cup. And when you find that the the, the wall is not uh, uh, adequate, you can actually then 
even go to the point of removing one wall, the anterior wall, and use the new multi-hole cup to fix into the other part of the cup that is like, for example, in this case, where the anterior wall was deficient, but use a jumbo size cup, we had to tilt it and make it a little open and leave it with some amount of uh, uh, sort of instability, which was taken care of by the large head. But then you can do that with this jumbo cup. And for our non-supportive cups on a certain sector, you can use these trabecular metal augments as shown here, or you can use oblong, as, as you can see here, you can see this a little trabecular augment is first fitting into the defect and fixed with screws. And then you have the cup, uh, the reaming happening here below it to fix in a normal, uh, normal sized uncemented uh, implant. And of course, where you cannot manage with them, you need some form of uh, contact between the proximal and distal host bone into which then you can cement or some, some uh, cups actually allow a cementless implant as well, like that. So, but rigid fixation is imperative and you need to reconstruct the posterior column and you have to have the ring in such a way that actually fixes onto the ilium and the ischium. Otherwise you don't have continuity proximally and distally and you may have more medial migration of whatever implant you put. The key after all this is really that you need to restore bone stock. And if you don't restore bone stock, you're gonna have a big problem because God forbid this new revision hip is not gonna last more than 10, maybe 15 years if you're really good or if you're very lucky. So you need some form of bone the next time round. And that is only possible if you use some form of bone graft or bone graft substitute. So please make judicious use of these. If you're doing a bilateral hip, maybe you can use the other side, which is still not uh, like we did in one of our cases, use that head as a structural allograft for this side or the autograft in this case. So the take home message after this little longish lecture is that it's a challenge, but if you can assess your defect radiologically, intraoperatively, especially, you can get away with a good stable fixation. You can provide some form of fixation. A supportive construct requires biological capacity for ingrowth as well if you want long-term success. The aims remain the same as, as for a total hip. It's restoration of hip center, restoration of leg length, stable primary fixation. Only then can you restore longevity if you have good bone stock. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv. That was an excellent uh, you know, lecture. And uh, you made the challenge so simple. Is there any questions from the uh, delegates? May I ask you one question? Rajiv. Yes, sir. Of course. Of course, sir. Please. Yeah. You know, um, you know, there are uh, certain papers on cup in cup and cup on cup technique. Yeah. Can you just elaborate a little bit on that for yeah, the so, benefit of the delegates? Yeah. So uh, actually I made myself uh, people who put in a large cup in the beginning can end up putting a smaller cup. And we've done that even in primaries. We're now doing these uh, what we call um, dual mobility cups. So a lot of people do this cup in cup technique by just sort of uh, reaming the inside of the cup, preparing and making it smooth and then cementing another cup into it. I don't have any experience with it. I'm sorry. Yeah, I just got a you know, comparative short follow-up, of course, in around four to five to six years follow-up. But in you know, a huge defects, you know, you put the cup, uh, then... Uh, Fix with a couple size. of, we have got a bone stock, then put a large cup, fix it with a couple of screws and uh, get a stability. Then you can, uh, you know, put another cup inside, uh, cement it cement inside and then the inside. line up and all right. these things. Yeah, thank you. A any other questions, Arun? Is there anybody, anybody in the chat works or in the, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv. You know, um, thank you, sir. academically, you see. know, most, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, what I would tell that in both the uh, Indian Society of Hip and Knee Surgeons and as well as in Indian Orthoplasty Association, Dr. Rajiv Toktal has been a, you know, very active. And of course, he is a great uh, asset to the Indian Journal of Orthopedics. That uh, he has been a great job for Indian Journal of Orthopedics and we are caring. Thank you very much uh, for your valuable time coming here and delivering this lecture. Thank you, sir. Looking forward to seeing you in person maybe soon. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, Arun, let us invite uh, our next speaker. Sir, next on... Dr. Paul is ready. Uh, Dr. Paul is uh, finding difficult to connect. He was actually traveling. Okay. So, and Dr. So, Jurani, is he joining? Dr. Jurani probably talked to you that he has gotten longer roster of surgeries yeah. today or some other issues. 
yeah dr anup jirani has excused uh, himself because he has got uh, some uh, emergencies in his theater yeah. so uh, then we will go to your lecture uh, yes, sir. arun yes. so um, dear friends uh, dr arun sharma who is the backbone of uh, you know iocon 2020 at uh, jaipur which is uh, seeing his face today that uh, he is the scientific coordinator for this program and is associate professor of orthopedics at sms medical college jaipur also and also the face of orthoplasty in sms medical college uh, as well so we invite dr arun to speak about uh, you know fixed flexion deformity of the knee we see many rheumatoids along with fixed flexion deformity and uh, it's a challenging situation how to address that and is going to focus on doing a total knee replacement in fbd knee yes uh, dr arun over to you thanks sir for a nice introduction i am lucky to be given a chance by you to interact with these galaxy of speakers who are very active in indian orthoplasty scenario so my talk is on total knee orthoplasty in patients with fixed flexion deformity treatment protocol and outcome incidence per se 60% in osteoarthritis as per this jbjs article perry et al demonstrated that is 15% fft lead to need for quadriceps to generate 22% more forces than normal knee why challenging because correction of higher degree of flexion and valgus deformity is a risk factor for common peroneal nerve palsy severe osteopenic bone are there in bedridden and rheumatoid patients residual flexion deformity persists if full correction is not achieved on the table which ultimately uh, results in poorer outcome and poor knee scores problems of fixed flexion deformity quadriceps mechanism at is at a disadvantage quadriceps fatigue anterior knee pain and decreased walking speed and abnormal gait it is as disabling, disabling as lack of flexion causes there could be a bony block which is degenerative osteophyte or because of prior trauma there could be soft tissue contracture long standing deformity results in contracture of posterior capsule and collateral ligament and a, uh, correctable or fixed early deformities and lower degrees of deformities are correctable with uh, under ga with anesthesia and passively ever 20 degrees and long standing deformities tend to become fixed and require surgical correction male sex increase uh, age existence of high degree of preoperative flexion deformity these are all uh, uh, causes or factors associated with poorer outcome causes of fixed flexion uh, causes of flexion deformity mild to moderate that is up to 30 degree severe 31 to 60 degree very severe 60 degree so in mild to moderate uh, degree of deformity periarticular muscle collar spasm which is which could be correctable under anesthesia then there could be posterior osteophyte tight posterior structures in severe cases eva plus there could be bony defect and in very severe cases there could be severe bony defect and there could be associated deformity at hip pelvis and ankle does residual flexion deformity improve with physiotherapy literature is equivocal and jury is still out basic pathology the flexion gap is more than the extension gap and this is caused by tight posterior safe soft tissue structures this includes contracted capsule muscular attachments fascia and even skin in severe cases the goal goal should be always try to achieve full correction on the table at least in osteoarthritis cases that is the dictum three aspect while correcting fft a good preoperative planning and interoperative uh, for uh, methodical uh, uh, methodically critical steps should be followed and then good post op rehabilitation and among in pre op planning clinical examination that is very important neurovascular status that has to be checked doppler studies if necessary status of nerve patient counseling properly because in severe cases there are chances that there could be some residual deformity bone defect assessment on x ray to keep more constant prosthesis as backup and in your armamentarium pre op radiographs that is very important x ray should be taken with the beam parallel to tibial articular surface otherwise the radiograph will be fallacious and lateral x ray and full posterior extension to see true extent of deformity treatment principle in fixed flexion deformity flexion gap is greater than extension gap and both the gap has to be equalized if fft correction is only by posterior release then it would increase flexion gap and if there uh, its correction is done only by bony cut or by taking excess distal femoral cut then that would lead joint line elevation so basic concept of fft correction is to address both soft tissue and bony uh, 
or I mean gradual approach by first releasing soft tissue and then going to bone bony release. So treatment protocol up to 30 degree. Most of the deformity corrects after anesthesia. Then remove posterior osteophytes, stripping of adherent posterior capsule after bony cut, release of tight quadrilateral ligament, and over resection of distal femur by 2 mm. For grade two, that is 31 to 60 degree, over resection by 2 to 2 mm to 4 mm. As a rule, soft tissue release, elevate posterior capsule up to linear aspera, elevate medial and lateral head of gastrocnemius, and transverse dissection of posterior medial capsule in refractory cases, and then post op uh, in splinting. That has a role. So, posterior capsule release, 2 mm additional distal cut. Then, in severe cases, grade three, start with over resection of distal femur by 4 mm, soft tissue release as in grade two, be ready with constant higher degree of constant implant if as over resection might lead to mid flexion and instability in some cases release at hip may be needed and then post op splinting surgical technique that uh, technique has to be meticulously followed once the major dissection are completed osteophytes are carefully removed from all segment of the knee removal of osteophyte from posterior femoral condyle clears mild degree of flexion deformity and persistent posterior osteophyte is responsible for residual flexion after tkr the knee is then evaluated for the space and flexion compared to the extension gap. Up to 30 degree of flexion deformity can be balanced only by sequential soft tissue release. And then flexion action gap has to be checked after each step. And sequence of soft tissue release that is remove all osteophyte, elevate the posterior capsule, proximally releasing the gastrocnemius muscle origin from the femur and tenotomy of medial hamstring if required. The distant most femoral attachment of the collateral and attachment of the popliteus tendon to be identified before cuts are made and protected by all means because these may be damaged during additional bony resection. Keep the distal bony resection as the last resort for flexion deformity up to 30 degree. For higher degree of flexion deformities greater than 30 degree, take additional distal bony cut 2 to 4 mm. Distal femur, uh, the, there is tight extension gap in FFD. It limits. Uh, Distal femoral resection, if it is 2 to 4 mm, that, that can be taken. If it is more than that, it could damage collateral ligament. It would elevate joint line. That would lead to patella baha and mill flexion instability. And there would be uncovering of condyle. So as per this permutation combination, this is, there is tight extension gap and loose flexion gap in F fixed flexion deformity. That is problem 7. So step one is release the posterior capsule and use a thicker poly. Does it help? If yes, then no other change is needed. Otherwise, recut the distal femur and use a thicker poly. Troubleshooting when the flexion action mismatch is equal to or more than 5 mm after soft tissue release, then use constant implant. In general, for each 10 degree of flexion contracture, an additional 2 mm resection is required. For flexion deformity greater than 30 degrees, post-operatively, we routinely give a knee immobilizer of three weeks with intermittent physiotherapy and then a night sprinting for another three months. To counter large fraction gap after fourth tissue release, the following can be done. Shift the femoral component posteriorly by making a 2 mm additional anterior femoral cut. Use one size large femoral component and reduce the tibial slope. So the principle preserve the tibia, control posterior release, sacrifice distal femur plus large femoral component. Treatment has to be individualized. Choice of implant for mild FFD, CR or PS, both can work. For moderate FFD, PS is the implant of choice. For severe FFD, PS or constrained implant. And for very severe FFD, more 60 degree or more, rotating hinges can be used. So our series, we got 60 patient, 85 knees in SMS hospital, admitted for total knee from January 2010 to January 2019, categorized into three grades. Improvement and flexion deformity, patient were divided into two groups. Flexion contracture was corrected up to zero degree in all except six knees in group one and 10 knees in group two. And in five patients, the flexion deformity greater than 60 degrees. Mean knee society score improved from 41.5 to 92.5 in group one. In group two, patients score improved from 18.1 to 75 and from 34.7 to 80.7. So the take home message of my talk, FFD is common challenge during TKR, multiplanar deformity, and it is rare in isolation, mostly corrects with proper bone cuts, osteophyte removal and soft tissue balance. Bone cut alone will not correct the deformity. There should be high threshold for additional bone cuts in mild to moderate deformities. Higher constant can be used in severe deformities. In osteoarthritis, don't leave the uh, operating room till full correction is achieved on table. In rheumatoid arthritis, mild residual deformity up to five, 10 degree can eventually stretch out. 
safer to upsize femur instead of trying to further release soft tissue and cut extra bone. Post op protocol in such knee is different from a standard knee. Use of posterior knee sprint, night sprinting, shoe raise, and dedicated rehabilitation. If pre op flexion cut fracture is not corrected during surgery, it will persist post operatively if it is more than 10 degrees or so. As we all know, total knee orthoplasty is essentially a soft tissue operation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Arun. That was an excellent, uh, you know, uh, deliberation of how to correct the fixed flexion deformity in different, uh, you know, grades of flexion deformity. Thanks a lot. Is there any questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Whether you use gap balancing technique or measured resection technique? In our setup, sir, your question is gap balancing. Whether you are correcting with gap balancing technique or measured resection technique. Because if you use gap balancing technique, your flexion gap will not be larger. For example, if you use LCS type or buccal puppas type of knee, you first stabilize the flexion gap. So you get the whatever size you want, you are achieving on step one. Then matching the same flexion gap to the extensor uh, gap, you need not upsize the femoral component, you need not go this and that. Your answer comes like a mathematics if you go step by step along with the formula. That is essential wisdom I will take from you, Thank sir. you. Thank you for that question. Actually, essentially, most of us, you know, we follow both the techniques. First, we cut the bone as per the thickness of the prosthesis, usually, you know, 8 to 10 millimeter of tibia and 9 millimeter of distal femur. Then uh, go for the look for the gap. If the gap is trapezoidal, then we do a release, you know. So essentially, most of the surgeons they follow both the techniques start with the measured resection, but uh, then land up with the you know flexion extension gap. But uh, what uh, you know, uh, our friend uh, just was discussing about in certain knees, like buccal papa's knee, that you have to be extremely careful that you go for the you know measured resection technique. Thank you for those. Uh, no, nice uh, comments, sir. Thank you, sir. Now, uh, is there any other question or we move on to our last uh, guest lecture? Yes, sir. Okay. So, may we invite, uh, you know, Dr. Amar Ranawat from United States. Uh, I know, Amar, that it's a, a very early morning and uh, thanks uh, uh, on behalf of the Indian Orthoplasty Association. I really am grateful to you for getting up so early and uh, for the cause of the academics in the Indian Orthopedic Association meeting. And uh, Amar is not unknown to the Indian crowd, Indian orthoplasty orthopedic surgeons. Every year you see our uh, conference, uh, you know, ROC conference, Ranavata Orthopedic Conference every year in January. And we all uh, uh, enjoy the meeting to get the best of orthoplasty academics there. And uh, we are looking forward to his lecture on the future of total knee replacement, which is uncemented total knee replacement. Probably it is the future because we saw the cemented hip followed by uncemented hip. Now cemented hip is the go, probably uncemented knee is the next step. And we are looking forward to listen to lecture. Without any ado, I hand over to Amar. Amar, it is all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Can you, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Excellent. Yes, it is early here. Um, and, uh, but I'm usually tired even when I go to India because of the time difference. So this is a feeling I'm used to. Can you see my slides? Uh, not yet. Not Can yet. Share so your screen. Um, you can stop sharing and again you share. That will be better. Share screen. Yeah, now it's coming. Okay. We are seeing your screen, but not the presentation. How's that? Yeah. Oh, this won't talk though. Yeah. 
Apologies for the Are you on an iPad? Yeah. I see. Let's see if I can move these guys. It's supposed to be there. Oh, this will move these ones. I apologize. We are seeing the Zoom screen there, your screen. You have to open the presentation, whatever it is. Sir, uh, I lost my presentation. Let me see here. You can first open the presentation, then share the screen. Okay. I'll try that. Share screen. Uh, uh, Professor Monty. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. We are seeing your presentation. There you go. Super. Now you have to make it play full screen. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Sorry for the delay. Um, yes, I'm going to talk about how we got to uh, um, to cementless knees now. They're taking off in the U.S. Uh, and I want to remind everyone that we hopefully will have an in-person meeting uh, of the ROC uh, in January 20th to 22 uh, next year uh, at the Grand Hyatt in Mumbai. So hopefully we can all see you there uh, with uh, all our ROC faculty and HSS faculty. Uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, they're not relevant to uh, this presentation. So as we heard this morning, you know, the principles of total knee arthroplasty um, have been well established. Uh, they initially started with the total condylar, where you had a PCL sacrificing uh, design. Uh, you had gap balancing. You wanted to restore the alignment. We used an all poly tibia. We replaced the patella and we use cement fixation for all three components. And this became the uh, traditional way of doing a knee replacement and it has, it has stood the test of time. So the question is why cementless total knee arthroplasty? Why would you wanna change? One of the most difficult things in life is to learn something new. Um, one of the Second most difficult things is to unlearn something that you've been taught. So cementless fixation has the benefit of a biologic interface between the bone and implant. And in that sense, it can provide a much longer durable fixation. It unquestionably has a shorter operating time. And I think now with improved biomaterials, trabecular metals, hydroxyapatite, uh, of the current uh, metallurgy that we're dealing with, uh, we have much better implants that were available in the past. And I think this will give us the opportunity to avoid revisions when we operate on younger active patients. But the devil is in the details. So of all the things I told you about what a traditional knee replacement is, this uh, design is slightly different. It's cruciate retaining. Uh, we use measured resection. It's rotating platform. Uh, we don't resurface the patella. The implants are impacted without cement. We increase the posterior slope on the tibia and we'll often do a, 
uh, plastic closure without using the tourniquet. So there's so many um, changes to your operation. It's a little scary at first, but once you get used to it, you realize it is a, a potential game changer. So the question is, how did we get from a fully cemented hip to a non-cemented hip? Because much of the data that is out there in both individual studies as well as registries support the use of cement, especially in the femur. But certainly in North America, 95% or more of stems that go in, go in now without cement. So how did we get there? Well, I would argue the answer was from revision hip surgery. In revision hip surgery, when we use cement and we use long cemented stems, the results were inferior to long non-cemented stems, as well as non-cemented cups became far and away the workhorse of acetabular preparation. So essentially it was our experience with revision hip surgery that made us realize that non-cemented fixation was superior, faster and easier to manage. And that confidence gave us the confidence to go back to the primary hip and start doing more and more non-cemented primary hips. Now, we have to be careful. There are some concerns. Uh, if you do non-cemented fixation, it may be more sensitive to malalignment. Uh, many press fit designs in the past have failed to show superiority over cemented fixation. They're more expensive. And as, as I said, not only have some failed to show superiority, some studies have shown superiority of cemented implants. So I think we need to enter this world cautiously, but remember all these studies were being done with older uh, cementless designs that didn't have the biological interface, uh, interfaces that we have available today. So here's an example of a a uh, cemented knee that has failed and gone on to aseptic loosening with osteolysis. In the past, uh, I would have removed this knee and put uh, very long stems that were cemented uh, halfway up the femur and down the tibia uh, to get my fixation. And if that person were to get infected, uh, it would be a very challenging uh, removal of that prosthesis. Nowadays, I do fully non-cemented uh, replacements using metaphyseal sleeves and short stems that allow for immediate fixation, immediate weight bearing, uh, and it makes removal uh, very easy if the infection occurs uh, in the early post-operative period. This has become uh, the main way in which I perform my revisions now without using cement, and just like in the hip, it's my confidence that, that I've built up in the revision setting that allowed me to try uh, the primary setting. So let's look at some data. Most of the data from the New England Registry, Australian Registry, et cetera, shows that cemented fixation uh, works slightly better there's not an overwhelming advantage, but it works slightly better. Um, and then if you look at usage, still the vast majority of uh, those registries, 85 to 95% uh, are using cemented fixation for their knees. It's really only in Australia where they have any significant experience doing non-cemented fixation. So what does this registry tell you? It basically tells you that the differences between the two groups are, are small and their experience is small. So you, you don't have experienced surgeons doing uh, a new technique in any sort of numbers. And so therefore their conclusion is cement is the way to go. 
right? Well, I mean, I think anytime you try something new, uh, you're not going to have as good a result. You have to understand there is a learning curve and you have to get more uh, skilled at it. So I think that's one way to interpret the registry data. So the other interesting thing in most of the registry data is that the cementless implants are not purely cementless. They're often hybrid where they would have a cementless femoral component and a cemented tibia. Uh, and so that confounds uh, a lot of the, uh, of the data. And just like most literature, if you go out there, you can find plenty of real, uh, prospective randomized studies uh, that show comparable results uh, with, it, with these older designs. Um, so it's, it's, it's promising. It's very difficult to find superiority, um, but you can find comparable studies uh, and then some studies that show cemented is, is better. Um, but there's really no long-term active uh, outcome studies and active patients and very few studies now using the modern designs. So th this is where we're coming from and this is where we need to go. So I'll give you a case presentation. This is a 52 year old male. He's 6'5", he's 255 pounds. So he's, he's bigger than me um, and has bad right knee, uh, big varus deformity, uh, five to hundred degrees on the left, but he likes to bike 30 to 40 miles a week. So he's an active guy. Here's his knee, varus, um, but he's got good bone and he's a big guy. You can cement this knee. I, I don't, I'm not saying you cannot cement this knee, but I'm arguing for his size and for his activity level, a non-cemented knee uh, will, I hope, give him much more durability. Now, if you look in this case, he actually had grade four changes on his patella. So I had no problem uh, cementing on a patellar button. Right. I mean, I think you have to treat people as they need treated. But for the most of the time when I'm doing these and the, knee, uh, the patellas aren't uh, too damaged. So for gr grades one and two, uh, I often will leave them unresurfaced. Uh, here's another case, a 45 year old female, uh, five, six, but also on the heavier side, 235 pounds, severe knee pain, uh, varus deformity range of 10 to 20. So, you know, we could cement her, but she's a big person um, and she's got, you know, really quite good bone. So I wouldn't suggest starting off with a 85 year old lady with osteoporotic bone, which I know you deal with a lot in India, but you will be getting more and more of these patients too who have, who have good bone. And you give them a non cemented fixation. They can wait bare immediately. There's no change in the post-operative course. Uh, and they do, uh, you know, exceptionally well. And you can see how the interface works. And now even this is an older design. This is the uh, PFC Sigma uh, knee from Depew, uh, which is basically their rotating platform design with a porous coating uh, on the back side of it. We now have the Attune, which has come out with their non-cemented version. And you can see several design changes. Uh, on the femur, um, the porous coating is more robust. Uh, on the tibia, which tends to be the weaker link, um, you can see the addition of four spikes um, off the tibial base plate uh, to support bony ingrowth, as well as the fact that the keel now has a tibial ingrowth only on the uh, upper one centimeter. So it makes removal of an ingrown uh, tibia much more easy. Uh, you know, you, you have to be in the room when you're doing these operations to appreciate that you can do the knee replacement from start to finish in 15 minutes. Uh, it's really a, a, an impressive um, situation where you may have been doing three or four operations in a room in a day. Now you can easily do six or seven in a room in a day. So it has tremendous implications because of that speed factor. So in my opinion, non-cementification of the knee is coming. 
It is the future. Uh, it works. Uh, it is a game changer. Uh, and it doesn't obviate all the other rules of, of knee surgery. You still have to align the knee and balance the knee. Um, but within five to 10 years, I would say at least 50% of our knees are going to be non-cemented. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks, Amar. Uh, that was an excellent, uh, you know, <clears throat> deliberation of uncemented knees. Um, now probably you are inducing me to do more of uncemented knees. Uh, what's the longest follow-up you have until now? The uncemented. Oh, uh, we have five-year follow-up now. Um, <clears throat> I've had no failures. Uh, you know, I I think the. So as I said, you know, one of the advantages is. If you get an infection early on, it's much easier to take the implants out. Okay. Um, but, you know, if you don't get any complications early on, they just, they uh, excel very quickly. And I think the thing to remember too is, you know, how you start and choose your patients. You, you start by choosing the best bone quality, right? So you pick okay. a big male that's got good bone quality, He's, you know, under 60, uh, and you know, just from doing the operation, it's going to work. And then you start to go to slightly older people and slightly lesser bone, and, you know, you, you start to push the envelope. But I tell you, you know, I have never done this yet, but with using the Attune and or using the, the uh, Sigma, because the bone cuts are the same, if you don't like what you see, you can just open up a cemented component and cement it right on, and you've lost no time. Okay. Right? So it's, it's, it's not, there's no recutting of the bone and rebalancing. It's just, you're just not happy with the fixation? Fine. Take it off, open up the same size cemented component, and cement it on. Correct. Probably this is going to be the future for the selected group of patients with giving a good uh, outcome. Yeah, Rajiv, you have a question. Dr. Yeah. Rajiv. Uh, yeah. Hi, Dr. Anavat. Good morning Hello. to you. Morning. Yeah. So my question is, uh, like you mentioned very clearly, it's the tibial side which fails. So the hybrid is obviously an option. I think a very good uh, message maybe for the juniors is, Think of it maybe as a hybrid first, because our bone quality in patients that we normally do surgeries for do, is not as good as what you mentioned. And uh, you've also been very selective about your patients. So what would be an ideal patient you said is a huge guy with good bone stock? You would not even think of doing this in a patient who had a poor bone stock, or would you? Well, I mean, I think here, here's the answer. I, I agree with you that whenever you're trying something new, you should start small. So I agree selecting younger patients with good bone is a good idea. Uh, I have no problem if you wanna just do a hybrid and get used to just doing the femur and cementing your tibia, I have no problem with that and build your confidence over time, right? But as I said, 95% of our total hips that go in now in the US are non-cemented. That means we're doing plenty of elderly females with osteoporotic bone are getting non-cemented fixation, right? So it, it, it'll work. You just have to get the courage to get up to that uh, place, you know? Um, and you know, as I said, though, every once in a while, despite doing a non-cement, every once in a while, we'll look at a stem and we'll say, you know what? It might be better if we cement it. So it's, it's not a crime um, to to change course interoperatively uh, and, and cement something um, if you think that's the right thing to do. And you've already saved so much time in preparing the non-cemented that to just to add this, I mean, it's, it's really, it's, you know, it's not changing much. So you should go in and, and say, oh, I can start this and see how it feels and see what kind of, and then, uh, you know, you, you know if, if it looks loose in the operating room, that's obviously not going to work. But when you put these implants on, you'll be amazed how stable they look. Since the biomechanics of the hip are 
very much different from those in the knee do you potentially like you said see problems on the tibial side like you mentioned and i also agree completely that you'll have a big problem on the on the tibial side unless you had a design which could withstand the toggle forces that happen with posterior roll back and abnormal or edge loading of the tibial implant which you would see with deep flexion in our patients so would you agree that it's a problem on the tibial side really rather than the femoral side so i think you know one of the things i like to see now the newer designs is the keel has gotten longer um and i want to see the keel get even longer so just like a femoral component uh it's quite long but the porous coating is only on the proximal third right so i want to see the keel get even longer and have a slightly longer uh porous coating but not the entire thing porous coated but use that length to neutralize uh anterior posterior and varus valgus forces uh, but I agree, especially you know, these designs right now are, are cruciate retaining. Um, and in those cases, if you have a tight PCL, that's not good, right? So you have to balance that. Um, but that's, you know, that's not good if you're doing cement either. Uh, so I think it's just, you know, that's, again, a principle of doing a cruciate retaining knee. Um, and, uh, but, a, but a PS version is coming out very shortly. And, and that will mitigate that. But then that post will see forces as it's coming forward. So it's, it's not without its uh, potential for putting on um, different forces as well. So I agree the forces are different, um, but I, you know, I think the, the type of walking that the patients are doing in the first two to four weeks is not enough for the most part to dislodge these implants. Um, and by that time they'll be ingrown. And once they're ingrown, I think they can tolerate a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Ahmad. That was an excellent lecture. I think we are running short of time. There are a lot of questions for non-cemented knees. Probably we'll discuss about it in ROARF next year in January. And uh, as I told you that, you know, all of us will learn by evolution rather than revolution. So probably yeah. gradually we have to adopt uh, non-cemented knee in future. I thank you again on behalf of the Indian Orthoplasty Association and on behalf of Indian Orthopedic Association. Thank mm -hmm. you.